Hi everyone, and welcome to this special episode of Low Season Traveller Insider Guides. I'm your host, Jed Brown, founder of Low Season Traveller, and some of you may know that we work very closely with both the World Tourism Association for Culture and Heritage, and also My Travel Research. As part of this relationship, we've been organising a series of tourism recovery webinars where we speak to global industry leaders from the tourism industry and seek to learn how we can come out of this current situation with more resilience. Our fourth keynote of the series was with Carolyn Childs from My Travel Research, who is the world's leading expert in tourism marketing and research analysis. Now, we've already released the Q&A from this session, but due to popular demand, we are releasing Carolyn's actual keynote as a podcast because we've received so many comments as to how useful and insightful it was, which was lovely. I'm sure you'll find this both fascinating and useful as we learn how to thrive in the new abnormal. Enjoy. This is our fourth episode, which is entitled Survive and Thrive Marketing in the New Abnormal. Um, And in the first session last week, we had Dr. David Berman, who provided us with an outstanding overview on what a crisis is and what the recovery tactics typically are. Then we had our second session last Thursday, where we heard from the WeTAC president, Chris Flynn, on the lessons that we have, and in some cases haven't, learned from past crises facing our industry. Uh, In Tuesday's session, we had Professor John Koldowski giving us the current position and outlook, uh, and I think we were all a little bit surprised at uh, the amount of optimism that came out of that session. Um, So in this fourth session, we're going to be building on this positivity as we hear from uh, one of the world's leading uh, travel and tourism analysts and indeed marketeers. Uh, And so I am absolutely delighted and thrilled to introduce you to our keynote speaker for today. Uh, Carolyn Childs is the CEO and future strategist of MyTravelResearch.com, where she helps organizations to future-proof their businesses by using the secret superpower of evidence and big picture thinking. Uh, Carolyn has more than 30 years experience using intelligence and insight to advise her clients across the aviation, travel and tourism sectors to help ensure that they can make better decisions. Having conducted projects in nearly 40 countries on pretty much every continent across all aspects of the travel industry, Carolyn's specialities include applying trends to your organization, branding, including destination branding, loyalty and consumer relationship management, customer relationship management, uh, marketing strategy, communication strategy, new product development, multi-country research, cross-cultural communications and factors, And finally, Carolyn is the creator of MyTravelResearch.com's Four Laws of Trends and our four-step Apply Trends Framework. A very good morning to you, Carolyn, and welcome to the series, although you've been part of the series for the past four episodes so far, of course, as our producer as well. Um, How are you doing this morning? This evening, I should say. Uh, this afternoon, Jed, we'll, we'll be optimistic, okay. <laughs> we're still in the afternoon. Um, yes, and actually, I think there are probably people all around the world who are listening in now who are going, we didn't think it would take long, and we've surprised it would take till four, episode four before she couldn't resist being in front of the camera. <laughs> um, so, yes, here I am, stepping out from uh, behind the, 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 the console into the front. Now, Jed has said some very nice things about me, and so did our CEO and president of WeTech, Chris Flynn, when he was promoting this session. But one thing I want you always to think about, and it always makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable when that happens, is I know how much of the knowledge that I have is incremental and that it builds on one another. So what I would say to people is if you feel that I have seen further than others, it's because I am standing on that. And I want you to take that own knowledge and belief into your practice about what you do today. That lesson is from the great Isaac Newton. It took 300 years before anyone managed to find new theories to surpass him. And the person who did, Albert Einstein, still revered um, what Newton said and recognized that way that we increment knowledge by sharing knowledge, by discussing, by having um, alternate viewpoints on things. Now, Jed touched on this, but as I said, what I like to think of my job as being, um, I've had my hair cut, those of you looking at the photo going, oh, she looks very different there. This is not me, this is you. I see my job as to make you feel that you're making powerfully confident decisions based on evidence. I'm not here to do your job. A lot of today is about getting you to think about and use the frameworks 
to do this so that you can make decisions with confidence because confidence is gonna never been in shorter supply than right now. But my job is, your job is to do this. My job is to help you think about frameworks and ways that you can do that. So the title when we were trying to think about this, I think what we're looking at is one beginning with survival and then driving through to thrive and marketing in the new abnormal. Um, for those of you who are like kind of, there's a lot of normals around there now and you're going, what the heck is she talking about? The new abnormal. I'm going to explain why I think it's very important that we understand the context that we're operating in. Then I'm going to talk about some of the unchanging wisdom that we have. I'm then going to say, how do we do marketing in the new abnormal? And we will be opening it up to questions. As Jed said, please share comments during the chat box, but please also post your questions. Um, Chris Flynn, our president and CEO of WeTech, is actually sat there um, looking at and moderating all the questions behind the scenes for me today as we go through. Um, so I think the reason um, some of you may have picked up from some of the other webinars when we've been chatting at the end, I'm actually very uncomfortable with the phrase the new normal. Because I think the problem with the new normal is that right now we are not in a new normal. Normal, when we talk about norms, norms are things that happen all the time or that are regularly occurring. There's nothing normal about where we are now. Um, what it speaks to is an enormous part of the human ability to create normality in apparently chaotic and difficult situations. Don't get me wrong, that is a wonderful power. It has helped proceed. It has helped take us to be the first geological age that is named after a species rather than after geophysical resources. But I think we need to acknowledge instead that we are living in the age of the new abnormal and we were already living in it even before COVID-19 hit. Um, if anyone would, is ready and sitting there thinking they've heard that phrase before, if you know where that phrase is from, feel free to chuck it into the chat box and tell me where you think it's from. And I'm just going to pause while I give everyone a little moment to start doing that and entering it. I came across this phrase for a trends presentation I was doing for a big marketing summit here in Australia a couple of years ago. Um, and the moment I read it, the hair stood up on the back of my neck because I knew that this was an important and vital way to think about the way that we act and behave now. The source of the phrase is the scientists who set the doomsday clock. And they came up with it when they decided not to move. Uh, if you're not familiar with the doomsday clock, this is an assessment of how close we are to global Armageddon or the end of the world by thinking of the end of the world as midnight and how many minutes away from that is how close we are to the end of the world. And they may put out an announcement that said, we're not moving the time frame. And what was quite interesting was all over the world, things go out, the doomsday clock is still, nothing's getting worse, this is all great news. And they were a little bit disturbed by this because the doomsday clock at the point was standing at three minutes to midnight. Um, for those of you who've studied history or, or are like me um, old, um, might realize that um, three minutes to midnight is where the clock stood um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when we almost had nuclear annihilation, and during the peak of the new Cold War in the 1980s. So actually, what again, we had normalized the idea that we lived in extraordinarily uncertain times. And it's no longer just about nuclear annihilation. It is about the fact that we're going to have increasing pandemics. It is about um, the fact that we have step change, climate change, that we have enormous biodiversity collapse. It's good for us now to be living in a space of discomfort because discomfort will help us create the next normal. We aren't there yet. The next normal is McKinsey's phrase. That's where I first heard it. I like it because it's about the work that we do now. So this time is a precious time for us to do that. Um, for a lot of people, I've, I've used some big, scary words. So before we go any further, I would like us to think about H2G2. Not COVID-19, not H1N1. Does anyone know what H2G2 is? Again, feel free to shout out and put some comments in the chat box or in the question box. Um, H2G2 is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And 
what I think, um, one of the reasons I use Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy quite a lot as an example is the front page of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is a travel guide after all, for those of us who are looking to travel um, just beyond Earth, but you know, into the wider solar system. The first thing that it says on the front page, uh, again, if anyone wants to stick something in the um, chat box, um, they certainly can do, is don't panic. So I've talked about some big, scary concepts. I've talked about living in this age of discomfort, of, of not being somewhere where we, we've reached a new normal. But that doesn't mean that everything has changed. It doesn't mean there are no lessons we can take from the past. We heard that from Chris Flynn um, this time last week. Um, there are lots of lessons in marketing that we can take from what's happened in the past. There's a great deal that we can do to do that. Um, but what we need to do is to work out how to apply those lessons critically. So we can't just import them and go, this worked two years ago or this worked three years ago. What we should be doing is saying, this has worked in the past. What about that situation means that it's relevant to this situation? So in talking about this and using some of those lessons, I think that we can do that. So um, here's some thoughts on that that I prepared earlier. So the global financial crisis, our last major global recession, and um, you know, don't we think nostalgically when the only thing we worried about was, was that recession would happen, that we weren't looking at recession and, and, you know, um, and a pandemic. But globally, some academics and looking through the Harvard Business Review worked out that around 9% of 4,700 companies that they analyzed came out of the recession in better shape. So first good news is someone did, but 91% of companies came out the same or worse. And they said, OK, what is it that makes those companies different? What was the way that they approached this? And I do think that this is an important thing to think about. And they talked about the idea of the Janus-like ability. So Janus was the god, Roman god of transition. So thresholds, it's who January is named after because it's the beginning of the year. He is a god that looks both ways. So they found that companies who did this had, to use the most overused word of the pandemic, pivoted, did so by doing two things. They were ruthless about what costs they could cut out of their business, but they were strategic about what they cut, but also what they didn't cut and what they did actually increase. And what we saw was that those 9% of companies grossly over-indexed on increasing their marketing. So what I would say the lesson we can learn from this is at times like this, it is more important than ever to keep talking to customers. It's the how, the where, the what that needs to change. The other thing I think that we've got, because we've now been looking at the evidence and assembling the evidence of this um, for a while, is that we actually have around a century's worth of evidence around the value of marketing in tough times. So 2003 was looking at the, the kind of last decades of recessions and looking back over that time, um, Ad Value, BL, Alex and Stephen King looked at this and came to the conclusion that the companies who had market share growth, who grew their share of the market, were the ones who kept, now they talk about advertising, I'm going to say I think this is about marketing, not solely about advertising, it's about connecting to customers with the things they want to hear. But interestingly, one of the very first studies of this is 100 years old this year. So this was when Roland Vale looked at the use of advertising during a depression, which is what we're going to have. And I think what's significant about that was the analysis that he ran was of a pandemic, Spanish influenza, which um, honestly, if we think things are bad for us, um, the, the Spanish flu makes COVID-19 look like the teddy bear's picnic. Um, so what we know is that people who increased their communication with customers, which meant traditional advertising in those days, but could mean many different things today, they were the companies who grow, the companies who emerged from the recession, who decreased advertising, came out with worse and weaker and were less likely to survive. So we know that this is important. So, OK, a little bit more of things that we know have not changed. And in thinking about marketing, I would like you to meet two amazing pieces of marketing technology that are actually around about 50,000 or more years old. And that is the human brain and the human heart which is actually what we're dealing with when we do with marketing. 
And the biomechanics of how human beings make decisions has really not changed that much. What's changed enormously is our understanding of those processes. I'm not saying that won't change in the future. Transhumanism is a major change. We could all be booking um, travel directly from our brains in about five years time. But the biomechanics of how we react to things and why we buy things hasn't really changed since the first transactions of I will, uh, you know, I will buy your club with my my piece of flint. We actually still make the decisions in the same way. So there are lots of things that we can do with that. Um, when we think about customers, I will say one thing I've noticed over many years for the travel and tourism industry is quite often we like to market to ourselves. What I want you to do is to take a clear eyed view of who your customers are and whether or not they share your taste. In many cases, your business is set up because you love certain things and you find that that connects with customers. But do not assume that. Understand who your customers are because their tastes may not be the same. Uh, now, I think in travel, we talk a lot about demographic frameworks. I'd like you to think that not all customers are the same and demographics alone are not always the best predictor. If they've all you've got, use them. But I would encourage you to think about customers in multitude of different ways. And, and this is a demonstration. Uh, this is rather an old photo, but this is me um, on my left, possibly your right, and my sister, Alison. Um, sat together waiting to go to a farmer's market in Sydney on a, an international VFR trip, which will be coming back. Um, the thing about your family is that you don't choose them. You may all be very different. Really, the only differences between my sister and I are um, birth order. I'm the eldest. And the fact that she chose to have a family and then go to university later. And I went straight to university and skipped the family thing. But we're actually very different in our holiday tastes. And I've used the framework. I've, those of you who've listened to my webinars before know I really love the Destination Canada Explorer Quotient profiles. I've put us into those frameworks. So I kind of sit on the cusp between the cultural explorer and the authentic explorer. My sister Alison is a free spirit. Um, what does that mean? So we're 15 months apart in age. If you market to us in the same way, you are not going to be converting us. It's going to depend which of us is planning the trip and whether we're traveling together. Um, again, not going to talk through all of the detail on this. This will all be in the slides, which we will share after you. But let's look at this. So I'm much more about spontaneity. I love surprises. I love uncertainty. I love complexity in what I'm doing. My sister loves consumption. She finds shopping. I am sitting there going, do we really have to go into another shop? Can we not go to a museum? Can we not go and climb a mountain? Um, we have different tastes about that. So I'm accepting. I love, um, in, uh, you know, non-traditional stuff. She's much more fun loving. She's very extroverted. She, she's the life and soul of every single party. Believe me, growing up with your younger sister like that is harder. So you then need to be thinking which of us should be targeting and thinking about the experience that we motivate. So there you see, number one for my sister, you don't have great shopping experiences, you're not getting her. For me, I want to be out observing and engaging with nature. I want to be going around and reading every single interpretive slide in a museum. Um, and I want to be going out and doing lots and lots of fun stuff, water based activities. I was actually out kayaking this morning. That's my social distancing exercise. Um, and then we can start to think about what those needs might be for specific categories or types of experiences. So this is some work that we did with the luxury travel category about four or five years ago. And we used a framework um, that's built on a, a sound set of psychological principles going back again about 100 years to Carl Jung. Um, but really, that was brought to life by two Ogilvy ad planners, uh, Mark and Pearson in the in the 70s around two axes. So the extent to which you're an extrovert um, at the top versus an introvert and the extent to which you are driven by the individual versus the collective. So individuals are your jet setters over on the left, your dinners. We found that there are really four core needs these days in luxury travel, indulgence, empowerment, growth and connection. And all of us, well, I believe, have a home one of those. I'm very much an empowerment person, but different situations will make that mean that we are in different situations across that time. Traditional luxury was in the jet setter space and the lotus eater and the hedonism. But what's really powered the growth of the luxury sector is into areas like wellness, um, into culture and heritage, 
into philanthropism, into multi-generational travel, the dinners, all of those are where the growth in there is. So you need to be thinking, who are you connecting to? And they're broadly quite similar in size as sectors. So don't try and target, if you're offering a really hedonistic experience, if you're offering that to an enrichment seeker, you're wasting your time. So be thinking about that, and I'm gonna show you some ways to communicate with them later. The other big market that we think is very important using the same psychological framework is the area of domestic travel. And we know that domestic is there. We're going to start with nanocations. We may even start, you know, day trips will come first. Then we might stay overnight, not, you know, a few hours drive away. Then we're going to spread out into our home destinations. And then beyond that, as borders open up, we will there. So firstly, I think this is an amazing time to put some glamour back into domestic travel, that it doesn't need to be the poor cousin. But secondly, um, this is some work that I, I did with my previous company, then came out, bought the research because I loved it so much so that I could share it with clients, where we looked at what are the motivations for domestic tourism. Now, at the heart of all domestic tourism is reconnection, reconnection to place, reconnection to the people we care about and reconnection to ourselves. But different experiences, different people have different needs from that. So some of us might do it through experience. We might want to go out and challenge ourselves. So that might be doing, you know, um, one of the great walks of Australia here. Um, but the other side of it might just going out and simple things, you know, ice cream by the beach, fish and chips with the seagulls swooping around, you might be that type of experience. So there is somewhere for every experience to do this and you can find and connect to customers by using that language and identifying customers who care about that through your social channels, looking at language, through who responds to your website, all of those things are things that you can do. Um, to drive that forward. So really, really thinking about that. Now, as I said, this framework was created for Australia. But I believe that there are lots of lessons that certainly would apply in every Anglophone market. But I think for domestic travel, all of these need states would have approximate similarities for domestic travel all over the world. Um, the other thing to think about, sorry, there's rather a lot of me in here, but I thought it would make it fun and get, help you get to know me a little bit. Remember that occasions can make a difference. So. On one side, you have my milestone family celebration. This was my mother's 80th birthday, and we went on a short break cruise. Um, it was not the kind of, my idea of a cruise would be Antarctica or on, on a Turkish Gouliet. Um, That's not gonna work for my mom, she's diabetic. It was about being together as a family and about doing things. So you can see, you know, we went to the gala dinner, we all got dressed up. So that's who I am there. But similarly, once a year, I have a ritual weekend away with friends. So about 20 of us go away, the golfers go golf, the rest of us go and do other things, which are, in my view, much more fun. Like we, we go, this is us at the Hunter Valley Music Festival, consuming local wine and food and listening to live music um, while we're there. So this is me with my friends. So I'm going to have a different aspect of my personality. So can you find the occasions that your business are and target and talk about those occasions, Pairing it with, is it an adventurous ritual weekend away? So is it a skiing weekend? Is it, um, you know, a food and wine, a music festival? Is it a culture weekend? Think about how you are using those occasions to make a difference. The final thing, particularly for small businesses that I like to do, that I think will really help you with nuancing your tone of voice, is don't think about demographics, speak to a person. It's much easier to talk to me, and this is a little bit why I've also used myself as an example. It's much easier to talk to me. So I've included a framework that we use in some of our marketing plans with clients, particularly with small businesses. And you know, to think about, understand your client and to create a person and give that person a name. And then if you're trying to think, how do I communicate differently to them now? You start thinking about their current mindset and starting to overlay that and think about who they are. Again, I've used myself as an example to populate this. So, um, you know, have a picture in there because a picture brings that person alive. So when you're writing blog pieces or, or electronic mail or even an advertisement or social media post, if you're writing to me, you're going to make it feel much more personal and genuine. 
So this is me um, on a World Heritage Site in Ethiopia, popping from hell, which is a long dark corridor with no lights, where you're not even allowed to have a light, into heaven, which is the sunlit uplifts of a small church. Um, so my goals and values, you can see I love to help people. Um, I like, I probably recognize by now, I am a little neuro atypical, um, but actually I, I, I'm quite proud of that. Um, but I do want to help destinations. Um, I do want to balance this and I do care about those issues that are going to be with us when we go away from this. So I want to know that I'm welcome and I don't really want to go somewhere where it's all mass market. If you use this, you can also think about how do you connect with me? I'm a news junkie. So if you've got the budget and you can buy advertising or display advertising to connect to me, um, or, you know, on the BBC news site, you're going to find me. I'm signed up for a million emails and letters. But I also work in the industry. So can we market to each other? I ask myself. So hopefully I've given you some ways and some frameworks to think about customers. The next thing I want you to think about is one of the most understated and undervalued aspects of marketing, which is consistency. We all love the shiny new ad campaign, the shiny new social influencer. But one of the things that, as I said, our 50,000 year old marketing technology of the human brain is that there is a neuroscience to communicating consistently, which is if you want people to understand who you really are, if you talk to them consistently, you use the same language patterns, you use things, you can actually get them to have in their brain exactly the same idea. So this is a TED talk by Yuri Hassan. I do encourage you to go and listen to it. It's absolutely fascinating. So that you can actually, by consistently using your, your customer's understanding and your brand positioning, you can actually get your customer to model that in your brain. And even more fun, so they played this game where they played an episode of the BBC drama Sherlock. Um, they got someone to watch it and to listen to that and recall it. And then they got him to tell someone about it. So not only did he have the messages that Sherlock writers had in their brain, he was able to reproduce that. And the person he told about it heard the same thing. And interestingly, because of the way we use language, it can actually even work if you don't understand the language that this person is speaking. So the more consistently you communicate, the more consistently your message will be understood and get cut through. Um, and that's important for two areas. And how do you do that? So why should someone choose you above others? One example of this, 11,400 beaches in Australia. Um, I'd honestly say probably 11,299 of those are absolutely bloody gorgeous. So how am I coming to your beach? And that's where having your brand and your brand consistently understood and frameworked and internalized by you is really important because it creates that meaning for consumers we know the evidence that brands who have that meaningful, they grow faster, they can charge more money. And just as important right now, they are resilient in times of crisis. Um, so that's very important. And what it does is it, it removes the barriers to selection. Again, very important at the moment. They're more certain than it's good. You don't always have to be the best. It's just that people have to be more confident. But the second thing is the number one way that consumers all around the world find information at every stage of their customer journey is through search. Consistent language, consistent terms, consistent branding is one of the most effective ways to rank effectively in SEO. Now, Google updates their algorithms all the time, but all of the time that is to get a closer and better understanding of your brand. So the more consistently you talk about your brand, the more likely you are to be found. We need to be internally consistent, but what we need to also do is to stand out in a sea of sameness. Um, I've done many focus groups and exercises with consumers where we put out a series of destination brand ads and we cover up the name of the company. And absolutely no one can tell you which beautiful beach, whether your beach is in Queensland or Fiji most of the time, unless there are some other cues like who's in the background, people cannot tell. So we need to find ways for us to stand out because the eye is drawn, the brain is drawn to difference. No one is looking at the dozens of beautiful red roses. They are all looking at that white rose. So that's what you need to be doing. And we can use that same framework that we use to think about customers and the experiences 
to think about the experiences that we had. So this was an exercise that we did with um, the western half of New South Wales, the inland bits away from the sea. Um, and we actually positioned some of their events. They have an amazing, uh, if, if you come out in January, when you're able to travel again, go to the Elvis Festival. It is hilarious and awesome. We looked at the different worlds that we could show people. New England is, um, for those Americans listening, um, we have a New England in Australia as well. So we looked at where those things and those positions and experiences so that the Southern Highlands subregion knew that they had to use a different language to talk about their experiences from outback New South Wales. So they used that language and that framework to talk about their experiences, to showcase their experiences and to do that. Um, and I think that's really important. The other thing that we now know, because we've got a lot more data to play with, is the importance of our brand assets. Now, our logos, our images, our, our strap lines are not our brand, but they are assets of our brand that if we use them, they can build distinctiveness and they can help us so that when I look at that out of a beach or whatever, or a forest or, you know, waterfall, um, I know who you are and what you have to offer. Um, and I've put up some um, that I hope, um, if anyone is seeing some and think, I don't know what they are, I've tried to pick global brands so that they will work all around the world. You can look at these ads and you no longer need the name of the company because so consistently have they used them. And once you've done that, you can actually start to play with your brand code. So McDonald's did a whole series of things with social distancing. They took the golden arches and they separated the two M's. But you could still tell it was a McDonald ad. So use your brand assets consistently until you've got enough recognition that then they create distinctiveness. MasterCard actually took the word MasterCard off those two red circles because they now want to do that. And they believe that talks about their brand values without them needing to use their name. And that's important because if you don't do that in that sea of sameness, so this is some work that Havas did in their Meaningful Brands Index with around 35,000 consumers all around the world. 77% of consumers would not care if the majority of brands disappeared. So three quarters of brands could go and no one would care apart from the people who work for those brands. You obsess about your brand. Most customers don't care. You have to create meaning for them if you're going to be in that 23% of brands that customers are going, if this brand disappeared, it would matter in my life. So you need to be creating that content. If you're still going, really? I thought you'd be telling me I need to put my ad on Facebook and how that works. Um, there's lots of guides for that. You can Google that. I want you to be thinking about these things that will help you build meaningful and long-term advantage. 100% pure New Zealand, one of the world's most successful brand and destination campaigns. Became so successful, everyone assumed it was a country brand and applied to everything else. Um, and about 10 years on from when they did it, um, they went back and said, did it actually work? You know, so 100 years on from the start of the PU in New Zealand, they went back and they looked at their visitor numbers and said, look, did it drive a growth in visitor numbers? And you can see absolutely there was a growth in visitor numbers. But what they did also check, and it's important to do this, is they checked their growth rates against the growth rates of other destinations. And what they saw was that their branding had helped them get approximately a six to eight percentage point advantage over other less well branded destinations in terms of driving those IVAs that John talked about. Now, obviously, we know there's more to this than arrivals. New Zealand actually a few years ago risked being a victim of being too successful. But it proves that in our category, branding and that voice that you use. And I love the way they've evolved this brand into the, you know, the welcome that they do now, 100% pure welcome, first of the day. They have used the equity they had in that brand to play with it. What content creates meaning? So this is again from the Meaningful Brand Study. Um, what's important, what people are looking for is different for different categories. And it's interesting because in travel, we tend to think a lot of it's about inspiration. We're the number one, number three category in terms of brand uh, categories that create meaning for consumers. But we're not very good at it at a big brand level. Booking.com is the only brand in the top 10 meaningful brands for consumers um, that's a travel brand. Um, then you've, I think you've got um, number 20, you actually get one of the hotel brands come in. 
inspiring is important it's in the top three but being helpful and rewarding so think about particularly on your website creating clear signposts to things that reward consumers so make them feel smart recognize customers who are coming back retargeting them directing them to places providing helpful content it's a big decision to travel and it's never been bigger so you need to be doing that and then make sure you've got your inspiration use your hero images to do that type of thing so it's really really important when you are marketing choose the channels that work best for the part of the customer journey that you're trying to implement. So this is some great work that Missing Link, which is a, one of Australia's top 10 small social media agencies has done. Really, really smart thinking. Remember, 90% of customers don't know about you, don't care about you, don't know that you're the solution to their problem. Only 7% are even thinking about you anytime. So you've got to be building that 90% so that when people start to be in that 7%, you've got some hooks to hang on. And you use different channels at different places. A couple of things are missing here. I think when you're trying to drive people into actually transacting, into buying from you, I think reviews that sit there for me in travel. The other thing I would say that cuts across all of this, underestimated your owned media. It's not, you should not be moving away from having a website. A website more than ever is your virtual shop front and we now know how important virtual shop fronts are okay so where are we now so we've talked a little bit about the customer we've talked a little bit about you and your brand what's the conversation should we should be having try now and this is some fabulous content if i don't know how many of you know travel sound uh, the travel cons um, consumer index so this is an index of positive or negative sentiment towards taking travel it's not the same as booking but it does a there's a very strong correlation, obviously, between starting to think about it, starting to look at it. Now, you know, at the beginning of the year, um, this is global. Um, you know, we did see pretty high levels of that um, coming out of that. We know that that's peak booking season for much of the year. Um, we saw it starting to come down as, you know, news about COVID began um, to really be something other than this funny virus that we're hearing about in China. We saw the world starting to shut down. We saw Wuhan shut down. We saw countries like Italy start to get affected. We saw it fall off the kind of cliffs that we saw in the visitor numbers that John talked about on Tuesday. We saw negative sentiment towards travel for, but interestingly, for less than two weeks. So basically between the 9th of March and the 23rd of March, we saw negative sentiment and we've seen it steeply climbing back up. We're starting to think about travel again. And in fact, we're almost back at the point that we were before the big shutdown, before the, the scary numbers internationally started to show up. Um, so a bit more evidence we're thinking about travel. We did some work here looking at um, whether people would travel after the bushfires and we then had to do our own pivot um, to talk about this. 43% um, of Australians at the end of March were looking at uh, travelling again. 70% of Austra Americans you know, in the middle of the worst, highest casualties are looking at it. At the peak of the disaster in Italy, people were locked in their homes, dreaming of being somewhere else. 40% of us Italians at the peak of that were searching for trips in quarter three, 2020, according to Ford Keys and the European Tourist Commission, who are looking at that data for us. Um, John used this chart in his session on Tuesday, but I liked it so much I bought the company. That's another example of a brand asset being um, used here. Um, so what I wanted to say here is some people, again, all consumers are different. Some people are locked down. Some people are cutting back. Some people are saving to spend. We're going to emerge. About half of people are just want to get back to normal or are actually thinking I might spend more. So you need to be thinking about who those customers are and how you're engaging with them. And I'm going to deep dive into that get back to normal and cautiously extravagant. I apologize that this is a little hard to read, um, but I couldn't get the sizing to work anyway. So one of the questions Ernst and Young in their study asked people in those two in those various segments was, OK, how many of you are expecting to spend more and on what when this is over? Number one and two categories, activities and leisure and vacations and holidays are the top two areas that half the market is saying I am going to spend more on. But look at the difference between the people in this get back to normal phase versus the people who are stockpiling some money because they're not spending. 
you know, 75% of them are going to be spending more on travel versus just under 10%, uh, sorry, 75% on travel versus just under, just over 10% on travel and just under 10% on activities and leisure versus 77, 78%. So this is why I do not like the new normal because new normal is these people. Next normal is who you need to be targeting here. And you also need to be thinking about this. So Ernst and Young also asked people, what will change as a result of COVID-19? Number one, the way I travel will change. And that's true for more than a quarter of the, the people who are traveling normally, and nearly half of those cautiously extravagant. So we, this is where understanding the mindset and communicating to your customers in, with your brand in this mindset is so important to do that. You've got to get that tone of voice right. So looking at me as an example, um, I'm desperate to be traveling again. Believe me, I never wasn't. Um, I know it's gonna be domestic first. I actually live in Australia, so I'm very lucky. I'm looking for amazing things to do, but also a bit of indulgence. My number one trip's probably gonna to be to the Adelaide Hills. Um, the Adelaide Hills was badly affected in the bushfire, the traumatic bushfires in January. Um, so I want to know the stories. I want to see both sides of that. I want to see stories of resilience and I want to know that I'm helping. Um, as an industry professional, as I said, I think we've got an amazing opportunity to reframe domestic travel and I'm, I want my trips to be part of that. I am ready to book now as long as I know that if the government extends the lockdown periods, I'm not going to lose my money because I'm not going to get anything back. So I am ready to book if I cannot do it. So can you find, not me, but can you think about who those customers are and what those messages are for them? It's important not only to fall into the mindset trap. So this is, I, I recommend you to have a look at these ads. This is a series of ads that are around um, balancing the brand with the consumer mindset. And this is a series of ads that all look exactly the same. Cover up the name, and I bet you'll only be able to get one, guess one of those ads, and that's for FedEx, and that's because there's a bloody great FedEx plane in the picture. And if you can't work out ads for FedEx, you've got problems. So you need to make sure that you, you talk about the consumer mindset and you do it in conjunction with your brand. Find your own unique voice. So this is from the global financial crisis. This was a hotel group who basically took on the recession. They said, we are not going to give in to the recession. We're about living life nonstop. So I want you to look at the language here. They actually used an obscenity in English. I'm not going to use it because I know, say it because I know we have lots of cultural sensitivity on the line. But they actually said, but we're going to have a party. Now, obviously, you can't have parties during COVID-19. But how can you bring that language of rebellion, of fighting back into your communication if you are that type of brand? Responding to that is going to respond to the mindset of the customers that appeal to you. Now, this is a COVID-19 ad from Dove. Um, lots of ads with health workers. These ads are different. Um, this ad is a Courage is Beautiful ad, and it shows the faces of health workers when they come off duty and they take their PPE off. I can't even talk about this ad without getting excited because I get so emotional. It's a brilliant ad. Their faces are tired. You've got the marks of their masks on their faces. But Dove is celebrating the beauty of who they are. Um, and that is very on mindset, but it's also brilliantly linked to everything that Dove is about, which is about true beauty coming from within and finding your own beauty. So it's a beautifully modulated campaign to do that, which incidentally got shared in the healthcare press. So great content is going to get shared and reach customers who are resonant to that, who are going to care and share that somebody cared about them, didn't just use them as a prop in their ad. Again, using those same kind of frameworks. So I was brainwashed in this framework when I worked for TNS Kantar. Um, our Morgan hotels are our soldiers. We are going to fight. We are going to fight back for that. Our Dove is a nurturer. So which of these are your brand? And which of these is going to respond? Which of these is going to be how your customer responds? And that is the language that you need to be using and the, the content and the imagery that you need to be using. It's important to have a plan because, as I said, we're living in the new abnormal. It's going to change nonstop. So definitely getting to do that. 
Um, now, this is Tourism Australia's plan. This links back to what David showed you in the first webinar. Um, I think the thing that's missing from this is what's going to impact on us from economic capacity and uncertainty around the economy. So I think we'll need to start building that in, but have a plan and accept it's going to change. Um, the mindset of consumers a little bit more on that. We know that there's a cycle of trends where we, you know, we come out of a period of, of war or downturn and we seek security and stability, which is our stabilized fund. Then we start to come out of that. We want to seek change. That change, we seek back control. And then finally, we go into a hedonistic phrase of escape. Now, prior to COVID-19, we were moving into this space. Um, the Occupy movement, um, the you know climate strikes all of those things we were there um we probably can expect to be back here because of the economic downturn and what was happening there and that's because if you think about maslow's hierarchy of needs we were up here which tends to drive the behaviors at this point we're now back down here safety security physiological needs so we need to be thinking about that and the other thing is it's the difference between the individual in franchise escape or individualistic spaces, stabilize and transform a collective spaces. So we're going back into that. So it's going to be about speaking with authority, with knowledge, with giving people certainty. So you need to be bringing that through. To do that yourselves, you need to scenario plan. So one plan, but lots of backup plans. So I've given you some examples of those. I'm gonna click through so we've got time to questions. Um, the one on the right is from Kantar. It's one that they've been using. Um, again, they've looked at the response in terms of two axes, which is how we respond to the virus versus what happens if the virus is a one-off versus it keeps coming back, which I think we know it will do. Again, I think we need a third dimension to this, and I'm working on a third dimension at the moment to say, how do we bring that economic uncertainty and that economic recovery into this? But having scenario plans, having more than one plan, and working when to switch between them is going to be how you move from surviving to thriving. So you don't keep doing things that aren't getting you results. It is absolutely okay to sell right now. We are moving into that travel frame. But again, remember that path to purchase, where are the channels? Do not be doing selling in these channels. These channels are your inspiration and your relationship building channels. These are your relationship building channels as well. These are the channels to transact using EDMs, using SEO, using paid search targeting, bringing people back, looking for lookalikes to your existing customer base. And as I say, I think your website is a very under recognized asset. We are ready to book. Remember me, I'm ready to book, but I do not want to be caught out with eight thousands of dollars with you when it could be with me if things change. This is a campaign for p and use even in good times. Um, this is a phrase to send shivers down the spine of people in Australia. So Ruby Princess, the cruise ship that is responsible for about one in seven infections in Australia um, is actually, well, actually one in seven deaths is actually um, already booked out for the first quarter of next year. So if you create commitments, something that we have committed to is three times as valuable to us as something that we haven't committed to. So even a dollar, is going to bring you sale, but remember to offer people that flexibility to come away. Embrace this time of the new abnormal to change. I still see businesses out there where I can't transact on their website. You know, even 95 year old grannies, even Captain Tom, who raised 27 odd million for the NHS, did so on a crowdfunding page. So if you cannot transact digitally, you will not survive, never mind thrive. And to move from survive to thrive, you cannot just be doing activation. So it is OK to sell, but you need to be doing brand building if you want to thrive in the long term. We, again, we've got decades worth of evidence for this. Um, we need to be spending probably about 60 percent of our money on the long term and 40 percent on the ROI measurable stuff now. Um, so really, I reckon you need to be looking in those frameworks. And if you're not doing that, you will just come out of the current, you might emerge from the current situation, but you will always be chasing your tail for the next two, three years till things settle down. So thriving in the new abnormal, please start getting your questions ready. I can see they're popping through. So Chris will be joining us in the moment. Um, understand your consumer. If you can afford to do so, do so beyond the demos. Consistently communicate your point of difference. 
use your assets to build distinctiveness. Think about those three pillars I've talked about, the consumer, the brand, and the environment, because the only new normal is the next abnormal, is the, is the new next normal. And that is the one that you are going to create as you do this. To survive, you will need to be flexible. To thrive, you will need to be agile, which is a harder and bigger thing. So I do hope we've got some questions to go for. I'm going to go to the question and answers and call Jed and, and Chris back onto the screen to take us through this. And then we went into the Q&A, which you can find in a previous episode of this podcast series. Huge thanks again go to Carolyn Childs from My Travel Research for providing us with these brilliant insights this week. The full episode can be viewed online at wtach.org um, and also lowseasontraveller.com and you can register for the future episodes which will be running throughout May on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The fifth special episode in this series is with Stu Spears, who is one of the tourism industry's leading experts in the field of sustainable events. And he'll be talking us through the six fundamentals for sustainable events in Tuesday's episode. And we'll bring you the Q&A from that session if you can't make it. Until then, have a great weekend. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay home. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, colleagues and social networks. Our content will always be free for everyone as we believe that travel is better without the crowds.